Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Because I did a presentation once before for another group and I did the whole presentation and no one heard me. <laughs> so I don't want to repeat that. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here again this evening to give you part two of my epic trip to Patagonia um, this past uh, November, December. Um, so some of you may recall the first step or the first part was all about the alpines and some of the woodland plants. Um, but we saw so much stuff during that, I think it was around two weeks that we're down there. So many plants that it was just too much to show just in one presentation. So I decided to do the step area um, as a part two. Okay, so you will see at the end this, this evening, all the highlights that we saw um, on that particular trip. So I just recall, recall back to the present, uh, the presentation from two months ago. Um, so we started in Bariloche, which is sort of down at the very bottom of the screen here. And we followed along the main highway, Highway 40, um, which became Highway 242, right up to the northern part up right here um, to the Lancope um, volcano up in that area. But most of that area along that road was primarily uh, either woodland areas or sort of alpine areas on the, on the outskirts of primarily ski resorts along that route, but we did take a couple of detours. So if you get my little screen here, my mouse, okay. So one of the places we went to was a place called Zapala. And we spent two nights in Zapala and we took the road across here to Primeros Pinos over to Zapala. And then we took route 40 back until we linked back into the 242 again. So that was one area we did. And then on the way back on our trip after we were furthest north when we came back, we went through Zapala again, and then we came back down through Highway 40 on this inland area, okay? And we continued on down to 237, on down until we got back to Bariloche. So it was a long drive in the last two days, but it was all in the step area, okay? So the step is basically not quite grassland, not quite desert, not quite alpine, it's not quite sure where, what it wants to be when it grows up, but it's it's dry, not a lot of trees, um, and it has some aspects of grasslands, but also some aspects of sort of the subalpine. A lot of very low stature plants. So a lot of people that grow rock garden plants grow alpines, but a lot of common rock garden plants we grow are actually from the steppe areas of the world, whether it's from Patagonia, whether it's from Colorado, because Colorado for the most part would be considered um, much of the grassland areas. There would be sort of steppe. Um, much of Asia Minor sort of falls into the steppe area as well. Okay, so the first exposure, I guess we had to step was right outside of Bariloche Airport. So the Bariloche Airport is in the steppe area. And you actually have to drive from there into Bariloche, which is then sort of getting back into the forested area. So typically in the steppe, you have rolling hills, reasonably dry, low shrubs, um, and very, very few trees. And what trees you are gonna see on this presentation are essentially introduced pines, um, primarily from North America, okay? And these pine trees were introduced as a source of wood. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these pine trees are lodgepole pines, which do very, very well in places like Colorado, even places like Alberta. Okay, that's where they would be native. Um, I will apologize. I'm just getting over a cold and my voice is probably going to come and go. So here's another section of uh, step. You can see here it's a little bit more grassy. Keep in mind that tree you see in the foreground is an introduced tree. There normally would not be very many trees in this area. But you can see we're not too far from the Andes Mountains. So it's somewhat reminiscent, actually, of being out in Denver or being out in Calgary in regards to the distance from the, um, the step areas to where the mountains themselves occur. Okay, so Anne, you mentioned about rosslit violets. Yes, we saw lots more in this area. And here is one right here called Viola Volcanica, which means of the volcanoes. And I mentioned in the last presentation that a lot of the plants in Patagonia are um, very um, cryptic. Okay, so they sort of, their foliage blends in with the background, blends in with the rocks um, as a way to basically save themselves from being eaten by uh, herbivores 
I'm not sure what kind of herbivores would want to eat these violets because they're not that large. The foliage is quite stiff. I can't imagine they're particularly uh, palatable. But anyway, this is Viola volcanica, and you can see the plant itself really does blend in um, with the, um, the, the surroundings, which are basically just sort of um, sand and broken rock. Now, we were a little bit early for the blooms on these. They were just starting to produce their flowers at this stage, so we didn't see any where the flowers were completely fully open. Um, and even when they are fully open, it's not as, I suppose, it's quite as decorative um, as some of the rosselet violets that we saw up in the mountains. But you can see, I just keep going in closer to different plants. You can just see how this foliage just blends right in with sand. And here's the flower, not much to it. Um, it, it op may open up a slightly more than this. I think that the pollinators are primarily ants because almost every plant that we saw usually had a few ants running around. So the fact that in this case of these violets, the flowers are right at ground level, it would be very easy for the ants to get in there uh, to get access to the nectar. Okay, so what was, was more uh, colorful um, in this area, especially around the Bariloche Airport, was Oreopolis glacialis. Uh, this is a plant we saw up in the mountains as well, but up in the mountains, the plants were just barely starting to come into bloom, whereas down the steppe, which is probably two or three weeks ahead of the mountains, the, uh, this particular plant was in full bloom, and you just sort of see there in the background all the little patches of yellow. A very lovely plant, up close and personal, with little clusters of yellow star-shaped flowers, on nearly stemless, um, and so just held barely above the leaves. Okay, so that was a very, and we saw that plant pretty much almost every day. So it's one of these ubiquitous plants that you see throughout uh, this part of Patagonia. Now, one plant that we did see a lot of in this area, we saw them in the mountains as well, but they weren't in bloom in the mountains, was Oxalis adenophylla. So this is one of the shamrocks, one of the hardy shamrocks. And there are some people here in St. John's that are actually growing this one outdoors. I've tried it. I've managed to get it going through a couple of years and then it dies. I tried one last year. It didn't make it through this winter. So it's very, very borderline around here. Uh, although a friend of mine who's growing this in Truro has no problem. He's had it in his garden for years. But Truro is a little bit warmer than, and a little bit drier than what we are here. But it is a shamrock that does occur in the steppe, does occur in the alpine areas, and is one of the few plants from Patagonia that we can, in the right location, uh, grow here in St. John's. But a very, very gorgeous plant. The foliage is lovely, but the flowers are just like the, so much larger than the foliage that when you get a plant that's in full bloom, you basically don't even see any foliage. And it does originate from a little bulb, um, which is usually about three to four inches below ground. Now, another plant that we can grow here in the land, we're actually growing this one at the Botanical Garden, is Geum Magellanicum. It's one of the avens. Um, so we grow, there's, we have two species of avens native here in Newfoundland. Um, one of them, which is yellow, the macrophylla, um, or macrocarpum, sorry, um, which is a got a yellow flower, but very, very tiny. Geum Magellanicum's got a fairly large showy flower um, on a plant that'll grow probably about a foot and a half or so in height. Another plant that we saw down there, which again, we can grow here in Newfoundland, is a anemone, oh, that's supposed to be multifida, sorry, not multifida, uh, multifida, multifidum. Um, anemone multifidum var magellanicum. Now we do have multifidum native in Newfoundland, extremely rare, only growing around the Cornerbrook area. Um, whereas um, down in Patagonia, the var magellanica is quite widespread. And I'm actually growing this one in my own garden. So it was sort of nice to see some of these plants in the steppe in the southern part of the steppe around Bariloche that we could actually grow here in St. John's. Such was not the case once we went further north into the steppe. It was all plants that I just would not be able to grow here as much as I would love to. Okay, so from the Bariloche Airport, one of the first areas uh, that we went to was an area just east of Bariloche. Again, you can see lots of trees here, but these are all introduced pine trees. Normally, this area would not have any trees at all other than a few uh, larger shrubs. Um, this area called the Reserva Laguna Los Juncos, um, like I said, it was just to the east of Bariloche. And typically what you would see in the steppe are there's just these sort of tussock grasses, uh, which in themselves are quite pretty. 
A lot of them have a very silvery sheen to it. And a lot of the plants, when we saw on the step, because it's dry, a lot of the plants were succulent or had silvery or fuzzy foliage, which are great adaptations to uh, surviving through periods of drought. So this here would be classic step, almost semi-desert, just the shrubs that were here, no trees growing in this particular spot. So this is sort of a, a, an unspoiled area of, uh, of step area um, east of Bariloche. So what were some of the plants we saw here? Now, up in the mountains, we saw a few calciolarias, uh, fishermen's baskets, we used to call them years ago. It used to be a popular garden plant. We don't see them that much anymore now. Um, but there are a number of the calciolarias which do grow out on the step. The one thing they do have in, in uh, common, besides the flowers being yellow and pouch-like, is the fact that a lot of the ones on the step had fairly succulent foliage, again, an adaptation to deal with the drought. So this is Calciolaria germanii and Calciolaria polyrisa. Now, a friend of mine again in Truro is growing this one in Truro. I have not tried it yet. He's going to send me a young plant to see if I can get away with it here. Again, I think we may be just too wet. I mean, this spring has just been god awful for any of these kind of plants. They just would not like uh, this constant fog and rain. Um, I'm sure they would not be happy campers. But this is a very, very short little calcellaria, only grows three or four inches high. Now, a plant that we do grow here in the botanical gardens is Azarella. It used to be called Bolax. Um, and we have Bolax, big chunks of it growing in our in our rock garden. And Bolax itself, the species that we have, is actually native in Patagonia, usually more up in the mountains, however. Um, as it turns out, on the step, we saw, I think, the better part of almost a dozen species of Azarella. One thing they all have in feet in common is rather small, nondescript, little sort of yellowy greenish flowers. It's related to carrots, is in the umbellifery uh, family. Um, you never think it was a carrot, look at it, but it does have a bit of a tap root. So I guess that does have that one feature in common. And most of the azarellas form very, very hard buns. The foliage is very, very stiff. Some can be spiny. Our bolax in our botanical garden is fairly stiff, almost more like plastic. But some of the ones we saw on the step were actually very spiny. It's not one that you'd really want to sit on, uh, unlike ours, that you could probably get away with doing that. So just a closer, this one was one that was very, very spiny, that the, the leaf tips were quite sharp. But this is the flower. What you see is what you get. Okay, now, classic in a lot of semi-desert type areas are the pea family. And a lot of members of the pea family are tap rooted so they can send their roots down good and deep to tap into uh, uh, underground reserves of water. And of course, all members of the pea family have recognizable pea like flowers. So, this particular genus, Adesmia, oh my gosh, I guess we probably saw at least a dozen species scattered throughout Patagonia, but Adesmias occur right throughout all the semi desert areas throughout all of South America. Um, and I don't even know, but it might extend up into North America in places as well. So this is Adesmia corambosa, one of the smaller, a little more herbaceous. Some of the Adesmias are actually um, uh, shrubs. This one here was one of the more herbaceous ones that seemed like it would disappear back underneath the ground um, during the winter months. And a closer view there of the flowers. Beautifully striped on the outside, these beautiful sort of burnt orange stripes. Um, another member of the um, pea family uh, was Senna arnotiana. Um, you might recognize Senna as being um, one of the herb herbal medicines they use for constipation, I believe, uh, as it turns out. Not from this particular species, however. But this one right here is um, more of a shrub, grows maybe three to four feet in height. Absolutely beautiful when they're in full bloom, these beautiful sort of orangey golden colored flowers. And many members of the pea family in these steppe areas typically are yellow. And a closer view there. So quite a different flower for uh, compared to most pea flowers. You might look at this and wonder, if, how is this related to the peas? But it does produce a typical pea-like pod uh, when it goes to seed. Now, there were uh, several other oxalis that we saw. Um, Adenophila being the most showy one to big pink flowers. This one right here, I don't even want to try to pronounce it because I'm sure if I do, I'm only going to be uh, not doing the name justice, okay? Needless to say, it's a little small 
uh, compact little yellow oxalis. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And a closer there view of the flowers. Now, Cisrinchium. We have Cisrinchium here in Newfoundland. Typically ours have blue flowers. Uh, and a lot of the ones in Eastern North America are blue flowered. But when you get out to Western North America in these drier areas, a lot of Cisrinchiums are yellow flowered. Um, and such is the case here in Patagonia as well. So this is Cisrinchium latum. And there's some variations. Some of the flowers can be purely yellow. Some can have just the smallest little tiny brown spot. You'll notice the foliage is uh, quite glaucous, almost blue tinted. <clears throat> A great adaptation again for trying to hold on to uh, any moisture that happens to be around. Some can be quite striking with quite large little brown blotches um, at the base of the petals. Now we did see two species of what I would consider regular violets on this trip. Uh, one I showed last month um, was a species growing in the forest. This is another one which looks like a classic violet, um, but that grows out in a step instead. So this is Viola maculata. And most of the violets, seems like down there when it comes to regular violets, are yellow flowered. And as it turns out, many of the step or semi-desert type violets, even in North America, are typically yellow flowered. So somewhere along the lines here, some common ancestor that's probably spread throughout the length and breadth of the of the Rockies and continued down to the Andes uh, was a, a yellow flowered ancestor. You can see the flower is a classic, nice little violet flower. Now, Fabiata imbricata is one of the largest flowering shrubs uh, that we'd find on the steppe. Very, very fragrant. You can smell this bush from quite a distance away. Here's a closer view of the flower. Okay, and even closer. And you look at that foliage and you say, wow, it looks like heather. Okay, and, and superficially, I imagine when it's not in bloom, you might think it's like a, a really large heather on steroids. Believe it or not, its closest relative are petunias. Okay, it's a member of the nightshade family. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, there were petunias that, are, that we saw growing in the wild down in Patagonia. Um, and most of those now have actually been reclassified as a Fabiana. So, uh, but they did look more like classic petunias. But yeah, believe it or not, this is basically South America's answer to a petunia shrub. Go figure. Okay, so now this is another little town that we went to, uh, Pilcaniu. This is classic steppe. We're getting to really almost semi-desert conditions here. No trees here. It's even too dry here to grow the introduced trees from North America. Lots of sort of rounded shrubs. You look at this and you, you think that you're probably somewhere in Arizona, okay? Um, and in fact, it was so much like just the uh, sort of southwestern United States. We actually found cactus growing here too. So it really was very much like a semi-desert area somewhere in the, uh, the western part of the U.S. And a lot of sand, which was the seal shrubs. I'm not sure if these shrubs would have produced flowers later on in the season. Um, I couldn't even tell you offhand what species that these particular shrubs were, but there was no sign of any flowers um, at this time of the year. But what we did find in between those bushes was another Desmia, and the only one that I know of that whose flowers are not yellow. This is a Desmia parviflora, which has these beautiful sort of purpley striped flowers, but very, very low to the ground. It, technically, it is a sub shrub, so it does have some woody tissue um, on those little creeping um, trailing stems but really, really exquisite flowers. And interesting that most of the adesmias usually had the flowers in clusters. These ones always had the flowers solitary, but all the flowers faced in the same direction, obviously following the sun for the most part. But they almost looked like they had little eyelashes. So they're quite a pretty little flower. Now, not to get, a, or keeping in, in line with other pea relatives, um, is astragalus. And again, if you've ever been to the southwestern United States, um, even in the Calgary area, there are astragalus species all over the place. We have a few here in Newfoundland, primarily on the limestone barrens. Um, ours are relatively rare species for the most part. But the one thing that a lot of astragalus have in common is they have these purplish 
um, or pinkish pea-like flowers in clusters. These are herbaceous, as it turns out. So Astragalus crookshanksii was the most common one that we saw um, out on the steppe. And there were some variations, some were more blue, some were more purple, much in the same way as our astragalus um, and our oxytropes can show some variation in shades of blue and purple. Now, anarthrophyllum strigulipetalum. Okay, that's a tongue twister there. I needed to have something here for scale. This is another P relative. Um, it formed a very, very spiny, spiny dome, all covered in these uh, stemless, um, orangey, red colored flowers. You look at it forever, never think again that it was in the P family. But these mounds were, I suppose, probably close to seven to eight feet across and about four feet high. Okay. So quite striking. We only saw two plants. We were driving along the road, saw these two plants growing right on the side of the road, stopped the bus, hopped over the fence, took our pictures, carried on, and we never saw this plant ever again. So it was interesting how some of these plants just pop up in a place, very, restri very restricted. And, you know, you think they would be all over the place. The habitat looked the same everywhere we were driving for three or 400 kilometers. And yet we never came across this plant anymore. So very, very unusual pea-like flower um, on this particular plant. Now, as I mentioned, we did see cactus. So this is Mahuinia patagonica. It used to be considered an opuntia. And opuntias are very, very common, in, of course, in the Western United States. But all the opuntias now in South America have been moved to the to the genus uh, Mahuinia. Okay, so this is Mahuinia patagonica. Usually, the flowers are sort of a sort of creamy white color. Okay, and there's a closer view um, of the flowers. But sometimes you find them in pink, and the pink flowers are actually quite lovely, almost more attractive in some respects than the, than the white ones. So you did have to be careful where you were stepping is the bottom line here because they sort of blend in and you sort of look at this and they actually, these are actually leaves, okay? They have these little succulent rounded leaves um, in themselves are not a problem, but it's these big long white spines that stick out between those little fleshy green leaves that cause no ends of grief um, if you're walking and not wearing the proper footwear. Now, up in the mountains, we saw, I think only saw one species of Janelia. Uh, on the steppes, we saw lots of species. So this is a classic um, South America um, genera, uh, genus, sorry, and it's related to verbena. Okay, so you're familiar with verbena as a garden plant. Janelia is a close relative. So this is Janelia cespitosa. Forms these little hard mounds, almost something reminiscent, I guess, of uh, Silenia collis to look at it. And the flowers, just like Silenia, are completely stemless, just held um, right on top of the foliage. Okay. And superficially, you'd almost think it was a Silenia. But in actual fact, it's, it's in a completely different family. So most Junilias do have purplish colored flowers. There's a couple of exceptions. Um, and most of them are quite fragrant as well. So Janelia cespitosa. Now, this is a different Janelia, Tridactylites, um, and it's one of the few Janelias whose flowers are more this, I don't know what color, I guess you call it straw yellow, uh, for want of a better term. It's an unusual shade. And you can see they can be quite prolific. They can almost completely cover the foliage. This one's a little bit higher up. The mounds may be reaching up to about a foot in height or so. But you can see the plants just get smothered in flowers. And when the flowers first open, there is sort of straw yellow, but as they age, you can see they're starting to turn this more pinky color, okay? So in time, give this another week or two, all the flowers will be this pink color instead, okay? So we were catching these just as they were starting to bloom. Now there's another Janelia, Janelia, uh, Janelia patagonica. You can see here the foliage is quite gray. It's actually very soft to the touch. Um, but an interesting in this one right here, the flowers were always right on the perimeter of the plants. Now, sometimes it's right around the whole ring of the plant. Sometimes it's only a semicircle. But you never saw blossoms in the center of the clumps. The flowers were always out on the outer perimeter. Um, again, for the most part, stemless. 
But in the other species, sometimes the flower is just solitary. In this case here, we're in, the, in little clusters. But again, very, very fragrant. Now, as I mentioned, lots of azarellas. This is Azarella trifurcata here. This is Azarella monantha. Monantha was really super duper hard, not particularly spiny. Um, you'd almost think it was a lichen uh, in all intents and purposes, a, a really bright green lichen. The, the clumps were so hard. You could walk on that and you wouldn't leave a footprint at all. Now, this was the weirdest plant we found. Um, it's in a different family. It's not in the family of plants that we grow here in North, North America at all. Uh, Gamocarpha macrocephala. And you just get these sort of green rosettes. And then you get these very, very thick stalks with this round cluster of green flowers. It looked like something from outer space. Um, and I, th I, I, thought, I thought they were monocarpic, but they're not. Because as you can see right here, this is almost finished flowering. You can see little tiny baby rosettes starting to form here at the base. So after the flowers are finished, a new rosette of leaves will develop again on the bottom. Again, these plants were growing in one spot and we never saw them anymore for the rest of the trip. And we saw maybe a dozen plants growing in this particular spot. And you see, here's the flowers. We were catching just a tail end. Most of the flowers had already finished blooming. Um, and there, there's a very unusual sort of greeny uh, white uh, type coloration to them. With these really, really long anthers sticking out from the flowers. Okay, um, Corinna Boudelon bicolor, another one of the shrubs. It was in full bloom, very gray. Again, typical of a lot of plants in the steppes with gray foliage. Here's a, the flowers. The flowers were nodding on them. There's some variation. Most of them were sort of this very unusual color. The flowers really didn't show up that well in the big scheme of things. Obviously, they had some attraction for pollinators. I guess the inside had these beautiful veins. And a lot of times these plants, if you look at them under um, ultraviolet light, those veins really jump out. And of course, the main pollinator will be bumblebees who can see into the ultraviolet. Um, and here's a cl another closer view. So this plant is actually related to mallow, musk mallow, if you have musk mallow growing in your garden. Um, and you can sort of look at those flowers, say, yeah, they do look something like a musk mallow. Also related to, holly, uh, to hollyhock um, and to hibiscus. Okay, they're all in the mallow family. Now, we did see another violet as we headed out over the, uh, over the step in this area. This one here was sort of almost the, the link in some respects between a rosted violet and a more regular violet. So you can sort of see the foliage here. It's like a rosted violet, so it does produce a rosette, but a much looser um, association of foliage compared to most of the rosettes, which were more like a hens and chick, very, very dense. These were much more loosey-goosey. Um, the flowers were a little bit larger for the most part. Here you can see the foliage. The foliage was quite stiff. Again, a good adaptation for drought, but not in that nice flat rosette that you typically would see in a roster that violet. But again, the flowers did form sort of a ring um, around the plants. And not pr not as violet-like as some of the other roster that violets. The flowers were a little bit more open, I suspect. Okay, so we're continuing on. This is a nice little uh, river system here in a place called uh, Pilolel. And you can see a lot more shrubbery along the edges of the river because the water will be more regular there. So it can support larger shrubs. Now, as it turns out, the few trees that you do see here are actually native. This is a native cedar, uh, austro cedar, um, or austro cedrus, sorry, uh, which is a native evergreen that's found in Patagonia. Another view along that river. So it's a little bit more lush, you know, just like if you're in the, in the uh, southwest United States, usually along the rivers is where you get most of the vegetation. And then once you get away from the rivers, the vegetation starts to become more uh, desert-like. So getting back to the pea family, in this case here is a Lathyrus magellanicus. Not unlike our beach pea, I suppose. When you look at the blossoms, they're very much like a beach pea. Uh, and foliage is probably a little bit thicker, though, however. Um, than what our beach peas would be. Lathyrus magellanicus. And you look at that, and it is very, very much like a beach pea. Now, again, 
where in a semi-desert area, there are cactus. This is a more nasty cactus. You can see bigger clumps, much more classic, big spines, Ostrocactus coccii. Um, and we're catching this one just as it was coming into bloom. So it's absolutely beautiful with these really sort of peachy apricot colored flowers. So again, when you're walking in these areas, you always had to be keeping an eye around your feet um, because you don't know when you're gonna suddenly walk into a clump of these cactus. Now, this is Hypocaris in Canna. And not much of the foliage at this early in the season. They're sort of related to coltsfoot, okay? So they're in the aster family. And like coltsfoot, there's no petals per se, for the most part. Um, it's just all these sort of ray florets, or disc florets, sorry, in the center. And just like the coltsfoot, the flowers come out first, and then the foliage comes after, okay? Um, so it would produce larger foliage later after the flowers have finished. In this case, unlike coltsfoot, which are bright yellow, these ones are always a sort of creamy uh, white color. Hypercaris in canna. Now, glandularia, glandularia oricana. Glandularias are very closely related to Janelia. It's another member of the verbena family. In this case, the glandularias always have pale yellow flowers, again, sort of straw colored yellow flower. We did later on, and I'll show a picture later on, of a white flowered version of this, which was quite rare uh, to stumble into. But again, Junelias, lots of them around. Junelia succulentifolia. The name will tell you it's succulent foliage. Okay, good adaptation again to drought. This is a little bit more of an upright Junelia. So it's not flat to the ground, more upright with flowers actually on little stems in a cluster. But again, very, very fragrant, absolutely beautiful fragrance on these. I wish I could do a, a scratch and sniff uh, part of this presentation. And there's a close review of the flowers. Really, really beautiful blooms. Okay, now, Arjona, Arjona tuberosa. I don't even know what family this belongs to. I don't think it's a family that we, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's Apocynaceae, um, dogbane family, but I'm only basing that upon the shapes of the flowers. So someone might look it up afterwards and, and confirm or deny, <laughs> feel free to do so. But anyway, you can see here, the foliage is quite felted, quite, quite fuzzy, but quite stiff. Again, great adaptation to drought. Arjona tuberosa. A closer view there of the flowers. And this bump you see here is actually a beetle that's got himself embedded inside the flower. So in this case, it's probably pollinated by beetles. Uh, Clarkia, Clarkia tenella. Um, there are Clarkias in the uh, Western United States. In fact, the genus is named after Lewis and Clark, okay, who did lots of, ex of uh, exploratory work back in the early 1800s in that part of Western North America. So we have Lewisia named after Lewis and Clarkia named after Clark. But as it turns out, Clarkias are found throughout the whole length of the Rockies and the Andes Mountains. And typically Clarkias are only annuals, okay? So we're catching these and still bloom, but later on as it's, the conditions get drier and hotter, these plants would just simply go, uh, uh, would die away, but not until after they've dropped their seeds. Now we're getting into a weird and wonderful place. So this is near a community called Illumine. Um, and we had a shower rain. I think it was the only bit of rain we had for the whole trip. So we actually had a shower rain, we had a rainbow. But what's interesting here are the trees. And these are monkey puzzle trees, Oracana, um, Oracaria, Oracana. So monkey puzzles are native to this part of the world. I did show you some of those because we did see some up in the uh, mountain areas, but some of them did extend just barely into the step area as well. Not too far into the step because they do need a little bit of moisture and the drier the conditions got on the step, the more they would be restricted to along the river edges where there was a little bit of extra moisture. Now, we did come across more desmias here. This is a desmia volkmanii uh, and this is an upright shrub. 
um, more keen, I guess, to a carrageena. If you're familiar with Siberian pea shrubs, we sometimes grow those as a garden ornamental around here. So the plants themselves are not unlike Siberian pea shrub for the most part to see them with these little um, clusters of yellow pea-like flowers. Now, Poletia hystrix. I'm going out on a limb because if memory serves, this is actually Ericaceae. I mean, look at those flowers. They do sort of look like ericaceous type flowers, almost like a little blueberry uh, type of blossom. So it was a, a bush that didn't have much in the lines of, uh, or in, the, in the way of leaves. You can see sort of very, very closely, if I can get my mouse to behave, my mouse is not wanting to go on the picture there. But anyway, we look really close. You can see it's got little itty bitty tiny leaves, but it's basically green stems. It's photosynthetic stems that this particular plant has. There's a closer view. You can sort of see those green stems there um, and a closer view there of the flowers. Now, this is a member of the aster family. This is actually a vine, okay? The Muticia spinosa. Um, and Muticia is a genus in the Asteraceae found throughout the length of the Andes Mountains. I think this species was probably the furthest south um, of all those particular Muticias. Most Muticias have yellow, yellow daisy flowers. This is a bit of an exception. The fact that the flowers are this pale pink. Okay, now... This is east of Villa Penwania, uh, again, along the river here and on the upland slopes. These are all monkey puzzle trees, but you can see in between the monkey puzzles, it's pretty desert-like, okay? It's mostly just sort of um, a lot of sand. It looks pretty bleak until you get down there and get up close and personal. Then you start to find some interesting plants. Okay, so it's a, a very, very dry, dry, dry area. Okay, so what do we see there? We saw Senecios. Uh, most of us will be familiar with Senecios, the ragworts, lots of different species, the vast majority having yellow um, aster-like flowers. This particular species, very silvery foliage, very succulent foliage, again, all adaptations to drought. We did find more oxalis here, the oxalis adenophila again. Further out onto the steps, the bluer the foliage became and the more succulent they became, again, all about the drought scenario. Strangely, these ones weren't in as far advance of bloom as what the plants were closer to the mountains, strangely enough. Okay, but again, absolutely beautiful when you see them in full bloom. And you can see the rock material here is primarily pumice. A lot of active volcanoes, I showed you some volcanoes uh, when we're up in the mountains, but even onto the step from, I guess, thousands of years ago, um, a lot of the larger volcanoes spit out lots of pumice. Um, so there's a lot of pumice um, scattered throughout the, uh, the steppe areas. This was an old abandoned homestead. Um, this was actually a stream. You can just see a little blue right here. This area here was actually quite marshy, which is quite unusual on a steppe to find a marsh. And all these bushes you see here, these low bushes, were actually a dwarf bamboo, believe it or not. Um, quite hardy, these areas would get snow in the winter. Um, temperatures could drop down here to minus 20 degrees Celsius. So it gets cold in the steppe. Um, but again, what snow they get is not deep snow. It's relatively shallow snow. So these areas can be cold, but they're cold and dry, which is probably why we can't uh, or are not successful with growing a lot of these particular plants. But in these little marshy areas was another Senecio, Trifurcatus. And these were, it was quite boggy here. This is like walking across a sphagnum bog even though I don't think there was any sphagnum moss there. And uh, all these little Senecios were, were growing in these little wet areas. Not very tall, two or three inches high stems with these little white uh, aster flowers. We actually found a gentian, which is, I was very surprised. I did not expect to see any gentians growing down in Patagonia. This is Gentiana prostrata, tiny, tiny, itty bitty flowers. I should have had my finger there. Those individual flowers are about half the size of your pinky nail. Okay, they are minute, brilliantly blue. They did stand out, but very, very tiny. 
Um, <clears throat> as it turns out, this species of gentian extends right from Patagonia right up into Colorado. So it's got an extremely long distribution right from the Rockies all the way down to the Southern Andes. Okay, so I showed you on a map earlier, one of the roads we drove out towards the uh, community of um, Zapala was the Primeros Pinos. So here again, in the, in the foreground here, or in, the, in this valley, these are more monkey puzzle trees, but you can still see lots of snow still in the hills. This is not the Andes proper, okay? These would be just higher hills, we'll say, within the steppe area. So as I mentioned, it can get cold, it can get snowy on the steppe, but it's just that it's a dry cold, okay? So we do get snow, it's not deep snow for the most part, not this wet sloppy kind of snow that we get here in Newfoundland. So what did we see there? We saw lots of Nasavias. I showed you those. We saw lots of Nasavias up in the mountains. It's a genus in the Asteraceae, closely related to yarrow. And you can see here, the flowers are something like a yarrow flower, uh, Nasavia lagasque. And there's a closer view there. And that foliage is really, really hard and stiff. Again, growing in pumice. Another rosulate violet, Viola trochlearis. So similar to that volcanic and the very first one I showed you, it's another cryptic species that sort of blends in with the rocks with these sort of brownish colored leaves with similar flowers to the volcanica, not particularly showy, held really close to the ground, almost the same color as the ground actually. And again, I suspect pollinated by ants. Closer view there. So their flowers were open, but you can see the flowers are not as showy as some of the uh, Ross and the Violets that we saw up in the mountains. Okay, now this one right here was more like the ones we saw up in the mountains. This is Viola Pachysoma, um, classic Ross and the Violet, really little hard little rosettes. Um, each of those leaves, especially the edges of the leaf, are very much like a fingernail, but same stiffness as your fingernails. Um, again, though, cryptic. The rosettes blend in with the rock and you get this ring of flowers. Flowers typically were served as white color. Sometimes they'd be yellowish, but in both cases, very, very heavily veined in purple. So Viore Pachysoma, this is what they look like from above. And you can see how they sort of blend in with the rocks. A closer view there of the flower. But you can almost see how the edges of the leaf there are very much like a like a fingernail, okay, almost transparent like a fingernail, and the tip was actually not super sharp, but it was it was fairly pointed. Okay, now this was the one we wanted to see. This is the specialty rosalid violet of the step, Cornifera, um, brilliant orangey yellow. It stood out like a sore thumb. However, just look at the foliage. It just blends in perfect. So you would not even see this plant when it's not in bloom. But when it comes into flower, it's screaming to pollinators to come and visit it. Just stunning. But like all rosted violets, each year the plants only produce a ring of flowers. And then that's it for this year. The next year, the plant will produce another rosette of another ring of leaves and then another ring of flowers. close view of the, of the blossoms. Now we were very, very fortunate. Again, you can see how those leaf edges very much like a fingernail. But as we're wandering around, we saw a fair number of plants in bloom. I'd say probably the better part of 50 to 60 plants. Then we found this one, which was almost brownish. Okay, you can see a little bit of that bronziness coming into the flowers. So we got really, really excited when we saw that. And then I was wandering around because we were like, there were 22 of us. So it was like herding cats, now you can imagine. Um, everyone sort of spread out across the hillside. And then I found this, which was absolutely mind-boggling to find one whose flowers were like almost chocolate brown in color, especially when the flowers first open, they really are chocolatey brown. So I jumped up and down and, you know, being typical me, got very excited. 
and uh, got everybody over and, and our tour guide who wrote the book on the plants down that area had only seen the chocolate form of this once before. So she was absolutely delighted uh, to find that plant. But anyway, after all that excitement, we had to look at the regular plants that were in that area. So another Azarella again, Azarella monantha. Um, fairly stiff foliage on this one. More reminiscent, I guess, of the Bolax we grow here in the garden. Another Junelia, Junelia micrantha, a very, very hard rosettes. Again, something like the uh, Moss Campion, the Silenia collis, but in this case, the flowers being in clusters as opposed to being more individual. Now, Jabarosa volkmanii. I believe it's in the um, nightshade family. So fairly large flowers, flowers probably about the size of a loony. Um, again, very brownish type foliage, which helps to blend in with the uh, background. But in this case, the leaves are fairly large and quite succulent. Now, Barnodia, Barnodia, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correct. Major, I can pronounce. Um, anyway, we saw lots of these little plants, these little green rosettes with these little bumps in the middle. And I was thinking that was the unopened flowers. As it turned out, they were the seed pods starting to form. As we're wandering around, we did find a plant that was in flower. And it's related to uh, anemones. Okay, it's in the buttercup family. And I suppose you look at that flower, it is almost like a little individual little buttercup. Um, basically stemless, just held right around a ring of these little succulent green leaves. Again, we saw more of uh, cactus, Mahuinia popigii in this case. Again, with these little succulent rounded leaves, but these really long, super duper spiny um, thorns um, or spines sticking out in between the more succulent foliage. Typically, Papigii has these pale yellow flowers. Now, we get to Zapala. Again, there's still some snow up in the mountains here, or in the hills, I should say. Classic, all these little green uh, mounds. Here we saw gauchos going through. They basically had primarily sheep. There were sheep herders who were going around doing their thing. And here there were a lot of different types of asters. Grindelia um, anethifolia. Here's some sort of little uh, carrion type beetle or a, probably a, um, a pollen beetle or some sort or another. I suspect that was probably the pollinator for these particular flowers because the flowers were full of these beetles. Another aster, Gutizeria or Gutiresia, Gutiresia solbrigii. I don't know who names these things. Um, Senecio, we know that one. Uh, phalaginoides. There's a closer view there of the flowers. Again, like to, like many of the, uh, the Senecios, these only have um, disc florets. A closer view there of the little, little individual flowers. Um, Hoffmansigia erecta. Okay, this is, believe it or not, even though the flowers don't look it, this is a member of the pea family. Okay, so it's one of the really weird... Related actually to the Senna, I showed you the Senna, the Senna Arnotiana that we saw earlier, uh, which had similar flowers to this, but the Hoffman Sigia, <clears throat> the flower plants themselves are much, much shorter in, in stature. Plantago pla uh, Patagonica. You look at this forever, never say it was a plantain. Foliage, very, very fuzzy, very soft. And then you have these rat tails, but you actually have recognizable little flowers, not like our plantagos at all. Another Junelia, Junelia spathulata, one of the taller Junelias in this case with white flowers. But again, very succulent, glaucous blue foliage for the drought. Junelia conibractiata. So it's the land of the Junelias. Now we finally saw, finally found some bulbs here. This is Zephranthes gilesiana, and the common name for Zephranthes are uh, rain lilies. So generally, these just stay dormant. You get a couple of big, heavy downpours of rain in the spring of the year, 
and then up the flowers come literally within a couple of weeks. And then they just sort of do their thing. The foliage will come up and then the whole plant may disappear again then after just a couple of weeks. So Zephranthes. So I suppose, you know, sort of related to the uh, daffodils and things along those lines. Now, this is actually a sheer cliff. It's, it looks like it's only a very low cliff. These cliffs here were actually probably about 15 to 20 feet high. And we we're driving along, we saw these patches of pink on these cliffs and it looks so dry, it's incredible. And these plants were just looking like they're growing in pure rock, but um, they're very obviously very, very drought resistant, but it only grew on these vertical faces. It's actually uh, related to the Janelias, called an Orissia. So it's quite special to see these particular plants. Uh, Lancope was another area. Again, you can see it's quite dry, um, almost reminiscent of the hoodoo areas around Drumheller, if anyone's ever been out to Alberta. It's very, it looks very, very reminiscent of the Drumheller area. Again, the higher hills, the plateaus here still had some lingering snow. We found no Nithera. Onethera, um, Odorata, so one of the um, evening primroses. Um, Argilia bustalosii. This is actually in the nightshade. No, it's not. It's the Bignonia. I'm trying to think the common name of the Bignonia, Bignonia family. Anyway, we don't grow any here. But you get these large trumpet-shaped flowers quite fragrant. Another rosalid violet, a very vibrant one. Brown foliage, again, to blend in. The foliage, not quite as stiff as some of the others. Um, a little bit of a looser rosette with actually silvery hairs right along the edge of those leaves. But these brilliant magenta flowers, they really jumped out at you when they were in full flower. But again, if they didn't have any blossoms, you probably wouldn't even notice the plants. Another Idesmia, Boronioides, another shrub. So these yellow pea-like flowers. Then we came across this beautiful river, the Arapo River. Um, and that led to, you can see a monkey puzzle tree here on the edge. And that led to the most spectacular waterfall, uh, the Arapo Falls. And Arapo Falls, that vertical distance there is 180 feet. Okay, so whatever that is in meters. <clears throat> but it's quite spectacular. We had our lunch there by the roaring waterfall. And the hills here were actually fairly green. But again, you can still see lots of gray foliage because it is still in the step. Lots, now we are into the Andes here in the background. So still lots of snow back there. Uh, this was the canyon created by the river. And then along the seepage areas on that river, we found erythranthi, uh, musk, musk monkey flowers. So erythranthi cuprea, which is the orange one, and glabrata, which is the yellow one. So these grew in these little wet seepages all along the edge of that, of that river and around the edges of the waterfall. So there's a closer view there of the flower. It used to be a mimulus, but now it's moved to the to the genus Erythranthi. And there's a closer view there of the yellow one. So these grew in the wet area. So not at all, uh, even though they're on step, it was wet step, I suppose, you want to look at it that way. Also growing in these wet seepage areas was Olin's um, Olsinium, Olsinium juncium, which is related to blue-eyed grass, the uh, Cicerinchium. So it was like a Cicerinchium on steroids, whose flowers were either white, some cases they were white with this ring of purple um, at the base. But you can sort of see in the close up there how much they look like a Cicerinchium. Closely related to Cicerinchiums as well was uh, Solinomelis, <laughs> um, Segethii. So here's a foliage, very grass-like with these little, again, very similar to a Cicerinchium type flower. Now we found an Acena here, which is one of the burrs, um, Acena splendens, very, very soft, 
silky foliage. Not much of a flower. What you see is what you get. Not much to it. Uh, another oxalis, oxalis compacta. Here's that senna um, arnotianum that I showed you earlier. But the whole hillsides here, and even going around these hills, all that yellow you see there is all this little oxalis. So there's a little shamrock. Um, as I mentioned to you before, we found more glandularias in this particular area, but we found a white form. So we were quite delighted to see that. This is trope, uh, tropeolum incisum. It's a nasturtium, okay? You may, be, you may grow nasturtiums as a garden annual. Nasturtiums belong to the genus tropeolum, and they're from South America. So this is actually a perennial species of uh, nasturtium for all intents and purposes, creeping along the ground with these uh, very, very blue-green foliage, quite thick and succulent, again, from the drought. Here are the flowers producing these big, big clusters. But if you sort of look at that individual flower and you put that next to a regular garden nasturtium, you can see, yeah, it is a nasturtium flower. But just look at that foliage. The foliage is not at all like a nasturtium. Very, very incised leaves, very succulent, uh, very blue-green in color. We found another rain lily. Zephranthes oricana and Zephranthes tenuifolia with these very, very narrow tubular red flowers. They would be pollinated by hummingbirds. We didn't see any, unfortunately. But it's classic of a hummingbird pollinated flower to be tubular and red. But it comes from a little bulb. And this is another bulbous plant, Calendrinia affinis. Big flowers that basically sort of cover the foliage. The foliage is sort of almost grass-like. Um, and these little very, very low little rosettes. Another rosalid violet, Viola tectiflora. Again, just that foliage just blends in perfectly with the rocks. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, you just walk around right past these and not see them. And even when though they're in full bloom, the flowers may be a little bit showier than some of these others, but still those blossoms are pretty small for the most part. But just look at that foliage. It's just absolutely exquisite with these long, long white hairs and these little white dots uh, at the base of each of those lobes. Absolutely incredible. And then sort of the ending off of the trip, we went to a place called Laguna Blanca. This was actually a bird observatory area. Very, very large uh, brackish lake. We actually saw Chilean flamingos feeding along the shores of the lake here. But you can see here these little mounds, still snow in the mountains in the background. All these mounds are Junelias. These yellow mounds are all Azarellas. This is an extinct volcano. In this particular area, you can see all the azarellas, the yellow, the pale lilac here of the junelias in the foreground. There were acenas here again, there's a little burr with a very soft, silky, uh, silver foliage. There's the flower, not much to write home about. And the savias in this area, these are really super duper spiny. All these leaves right here were like basically thorns, okay? They would impale you um, an inch or two. Um, in length with these little flowers that were held in the leaf axles. So spiny, spiny, spiny. Watch where you're walking. Lots of different species in the savia, which all have flowers very, very similar in structure. There's the azarellas, trifurcatas in this case. These little hard domes with these little pale yellowy green flowers. Another adesmia, uh, this one with just individual little yellow flowers right on the ground. A senecio subulatus, typical little yellow aster. Closer view of the flower. Senecio steparius, 
closer there. There's another one that's only got uh, disc florets. Grindelia chiloenzi. That's a little yellow daisy again. As I mentioned, all those little mauvey mounds that we saw were the Junelia cespitosas. Here's the Azarella right next to it. And here's a Nasavia in the foreground. A closer view there. This is an interesting uh, Junelia because the flowers open up almost white. And as they age, they deepen to this dark purpley blue. Junelia micrantha again. Uh, Junelia ulicina, which is one of the few white flower Junelias. And these were all fragrant, so it was just beautiful walking through this area. Junelia patagonica, with these brownish colored flowers, very, very soft, silky. You almost want to lie down this one here and cover it over like a, like a felt sheet. It was incredible. Um, Mulgurea. C. droides. It's another relative of a Junelia. Uh, Clinoponium darwinii. This is actually in the mint family. One of your, I think it's the only member of the mint family that we saw when we were on this trip. But classic little mounds, superficially look like a Junelia. Um, Lacanthophora, um, Emichionii. This is in a mallow family, okay? So related to the hollyhock again, but beautiful silver foliage. And we saw some more cactus, Petrocactus um, nequiensis. Look at that mount, that the the, uh, the actual pad of that succulent of that cactus blends right with the rocks. Even the flowers were brown. Absolutely incredible, albeit like like uh, burnished copper to look at it. But I mean, just, I mean, here's the rock. Here's the cactus. It's the exact same shade. You would not see it if it wasn't in bloom. And then the flower is almost, like I said, it's like the color of copper. It's absolutely incredible. Now, some of them were a little bit more pinkish. But again, the little rosettes from those um, cactus, you wouldn't even notice them. In fact, when I found them, I thought it was... Uh, sheep droppings. I thought it was sheep poop that I was looking at until I saw the flowers. This one here was more classic of a cactus, uh, Mahuiniopsis darwinii. Very, very long spines on this one. And you can see a big old bumblebee poking his way down inside there. So that was one of the main pollinators for these. And at that, I'm going to give you an aerial shot. This is when we were landing in our plane. Here's the Andes in the background, and we're flying over the steppe, about to land in Bariloche. And thank you very much. Questions? Oh, thank you, Todd. All I can say is, wow. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. What a trip. I I will just ask if anyone does have questions. I've got one, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has one immediately. Anne, did you have a question? I don't have a question. Just thank you. It was fabulous. I loved seeing <laughs> Bolax being called another name. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And of course, I love the violas. It's It was beautiful. Thank you. No, I quite enjoyed it. The um, Yeah, we ended up seeing, I think, 12 species of those rosalid violets, but I think there's around 40 to 50 um, that exist down that part of the world. And there's new species being found every three or four years, someone finds a new population because a lot of these only grow on a particular step, a particular mountain slope, whatever the case may be. And there's not a lot of people living down this part of the world. So a lot of these areas have never, even today, have still not been explored properly when it comes to uh, looking at the botany of the areas. Yeah, yeah, no, and and it was cool. It, it, the Bolex has Az Azarella. Is that what you call it? Azarella, Azarella, yeah. Azarella. Okay, yeah, and it was cool to see so many different of those. I'll, I'll stop calling them Bolex now. 
because yeah. I just I always thought that was a really cool plant in itself. So it was really neat to see different forms of that. So that was, and I mean, yeah, one, and one shot could have been the rock garden in the botanical garden. Well, like, yeah, exactly. Right. You know. Um, yeah. And you know, it, you know, they all look basically, you know, same. The main difference was just in the way the foliage was. So if you saw the individual foliage was different between the different species, but the overall habit was just a, a green mound, right? Yeah, no, they were great. Thank you. I quite enjoyed the show. <laughs> uh, Todd, I forget what the plant was called, but you showed a sort of a sprawling plant with the, the a profusion of flowers splayed around it right on the ground. Uh, the one that was right on the perimeter of the plant? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, suppose... that, was one, that was one of the Janellias. Yeah, do you suppose that the, that sort of low lying uh, aspect of the flowers was for heat, you know, getting it from the soil or something? You know, it, that thought crossed my mind, but um, yeah, I, for want of a better explanation, it was funny that that particular species, the flowers were always right at the very perimeter of the plants. And some of the plants were, you know, maybe geez, maybe two, three feet across, but there wouldn't be a single flower, no buds, no no finished flowers, nothing, only foliage in the middle, and, you know, mounds getting up maybe six, seven inches high in the middle, and then all the flowers are just right, always right around the very edges. So, obviously, yes, closer to the ground would be warmer. Um, I don't know who the pollinators were. Are they using ants? I don't know. These are fragrant flowers. They are somewhat tubular, um, so I would think maybe butterflies or something with a longer proboscis would do the trick on those, but I honestly don't know. Because, maybe, you know, if the sun was beating on the rocks all day, it would probably keep that uh, surface warm in, uh, into the night, you know? Yep, yep, I agree. And if there was night night pollinators or something, they might, you know, they might... Could be. Out. And these areas, you know, it was warm. During the day when we were there, the temperatures were comfortable, you know, 22, 23 degrees. But early in the mornings, the temperatures would be only two and three degrees. So it would be close to frost every night, at least at that time of the year when the plants are in bloom. Todd, I was going to ask, uh, you mentioned that the, the plants seem to be uh, cryptic or, or, you know, camouflaged so yep. that they might not get eaten. Did you have any idea what might want to eat them it was amazing the colors yeah and you know i didn't see much in the line of um large herbivores like i know that there are vicuñas in the area which is basically south american camel um <clears throat> and what they would typically be feeding on i have no idea um we never saw much in the line of birds that would cause any kind of damage because most of the birds we saw were just like little brown jobs, little little brown sparrows and pipits and things along those. So they were going to feed on seeds and or insects for the most part. So I'm not sure what they were trying to hide themselves from, to tell you the truth. But I tell you now that a lot of these plants, when they're not in flower, you just walk right on past them and never notice them. Hmm. Wow. And and those another, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh I, I did have another question. I was just wondering how you could possibly remember all the names. Did did you, at at the end of the hour, write them down, or did you write them as you saw them? No, what well, we just we incredible. would have a um, in the evenings are, well, some cases I would write them down as I was going as I was going along, um, if the guide hadn't been nearby. Other times then she would post a lot of pictures because we had a WhatsApp um, group that we created on this trip. So in the evenings, uh, Marcella would post a lot of her pictures of the plants with their names. So then I could just sort of look at that. It was on the WhatsApp, so it was there. So then I could wait until I downloaded my pictures to find out what the heck they were. Um, she also wrote the books on the flora of that area. Her books were fantastic, lots of photos. So in the evenings, usually what I would do the last hour before I went to bed is I would look at my pictures, especially on my phone, because you can actually label your, your pictures on your phone, you know, and compare them to the to the book. Um, and most of the plants that we saw were in her book. So it was absolutely fantastic you know, in that regards. Well, 
Thank you. Todd, so I'm going to have to ask you about that because I've never figured out how to label my pictures on my phone. Either. Oh, I, I only discovered it myself yeah. by happenstance um, this past year. And now it's great because uh, even in, the, you know, when I'm just looking at something here in Newfoundland, I just I have to take the picture, call up my picture and I'll put a name on it right away. So next time, next time I see you, I'll show you how yes. to do that. Please. Thank you. Uh, Todd, um, as sort of following from the uh, Janelia thing uh, earlier on, a lot of the plants seem to be really, really pasted on the ground, almost no profile. Is that, is that, I don't know, is it windy? Is it? Is yes. It, it is. So it, it may yeah. be that they're low profile just because of the wind. It's all the about the wind. Patagonia is known for its winds. It can have wicked, wicked winds. Now, we were very fortunate that most of the days that we were there were not too bad. There was one day that it was, I'd say the winds were probably 70 kilometers. But I mean, that's, that's nothing for us. That's just a classic day here in Newfoundland, right? But uh but no doubt, yes, that's the main reason why so many of these plants form these really low mounds with the flowers held right above the foliage because they're getting into that slightly calmer level uh, that exists close to the ground in these really windy areas. And I suspect a lot of the pollinators are probably just walking. They're not going to be pollinators are going to fly high <clears throat> and come into the flowers. The pollinators are just going to fly very, very low over the surface of the ground better better able then to to find these flowers that are held there that held that close to the ground and, and because they're so spread out and there a lot of them seem like they're succulent i suppose they'd keep some uh, some dampness underneath these break sprawling things and, and maybe yep. just preserve a little bit of it yeah and just like our our plants you know they a lot of them are tap rooted so the roots go down quite a ways um maybe able to tap into some of the moisture levels that might be there a lot of them succulent foliage, a lot of them with sort of gray fuzzy foliage, um, you know, so lots of classic adaptations to deal with dry, dry conditions. Mm -hmm. Todd, uh, Dorothy yep. here. Um, I find it very difficult to visualize the flower on the ground because they're probably not much more than a half an inch, if an inch wide. Mm-hmm. And when you see them on your beautiful photos, they could be as big as a rose. <laughs> true, true. Um, yeah. I guess what I'm, I'm going to have to start doing now in the future is like putting something there for scale. And it's not something I've done a lot of, but I think I, I start I need to start to do that because this this question comes up all the time. And especially when you're taking pictures of sort of alpine kind of plants, which normally what I do take. A lot of them do have very small flowers. So you need to have like, well, I'd say a penny, but we don't have pennies anymore. Yes. So I guess a dime. <laughs> I would take a Canadian dime with me everywhere I go when I'm going into these exotic areas. So we'll have some, a little bit of a, of a, uh, uh, something for scale. But essentially, I mean, you've been up on the Northern Peninsula. You've seen what the Moss Campion looks like. Uh, you've seen what Diapensia looks like. So very, very same idea. So just sort of keep those two plants in the back of your mind because a lot of the plants that I saw in Patagonia were superficially very, very similar to Moss Campion or to Diapensias in that regard. It's just being these little domes with these relatively small little flowers. Sometimes when I have taken pictures myself when I, we've been out, I put down a, a loony or a toony or something next to it because when I get home, it's like, okay, how big was that? Hmm. No, that's you a know. good point. Like I said, I, 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 and I have done it a little bit. Sometimes I've used my lens cap um, as a scale. Right. But of course, mm -hmm. lens caps are huge. So I think it'd be better. And lens caps can vary depending on the kind of camera you're using as well. Right. So uh, something like, like I said, a dime or a quarter or a nickel would be something that we'd all recognize then as, as far as scale is concerned. Thank you. Uh, beautiful photos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd, um, I know it's dry country, but, you know, you showed a river valley and stuff. Did you find very much in the way of sort of not dry uh, ground plants, you know, like a, sort of along rivers or anything? Was there much of that? Um, 
I'm going to say yes, mm -hmm. but I'm going to admit that I didn't look for those kind of things. <laughs> I figured that. I figured that. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it, these kind of trips are are geared for whatever you want to focus on. Yeah. In my case, I was focusing on anything that looked like it was a rock garden plant. Uh, um, you know, and it was a rock garden, you know, a North American Rock Garden <laughs> Society tour. So we were all sort of the same, um, just in that regard, you know, as far as our focus was concerned. I'm sure there were all sorts of aquatic -y kind of things that were growing along these river edges. Um, but like I said, I really didn't, I wasn't leaving, wasn't looking for them to be perfectly maybe, honest. Maybe on your next aquarium garden trip. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, I'd like to say again, I thought your photos were wonderful because you took them from different perspectives, you know, I mean, far, further away and then close ups. And I, I wish you could have, I, well, I'm glad you didn't see me because sometimes I'd be just getting right up into the face of the computer to look, you know, I, even closer because some of the flowers were so remarkable. Yeah. Well, yeah, some of them, you know, and, and, and you really do need to be you know when you're even when you're in the wild a lot of times you don't appreciate the intricate beauty of the flowers even when i'm taking the pictures i'm not seeing that it's not until after i've downloaded the pictures there's like oh wow gee just yeah. look at all those little stripes in the center of that flower i never noticed that you know when, when i was seeing them before or the fact that the flowers actually do change color um of course a lot of flowers do that they open up one color then as they age they they get darker or whatever or paler depending on the plant Usually it's a way to let the pollinators know I've been pollinated or I haven't been pollinated. Um, but again, you don't, when you're there with these groups and you're seeing these plants and you're walking, 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 snapping a picture, walking, 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 you don't have the time to the same degree to sit there and, you know, and sort of plop yourself down and become one with the plant, <laughs> so to speak. Right. You're just like I said, you're, you're like the browsers just you know, like the caribou out feeding on the on the lichens, they're just <laughs> taking a bite, walking, taking a bite, walking, and that's sort of almost what we're doing on these tours, right? Yeah. So uh, that is the unfortunate part, and I think our I, I don't know what I want, want to call it a problem, but our guide was driven. Oh boy, was she driven, and she wanted us to see everything, um, and we would start, you know, we're usually in the field by nine o'clock at the latest some days earlier that wasn't in itself wasn't a problem nine o'clock is fine for me but we'd still be out in the field at six and seven o'clock in the evening mm -hmm. and then we wouldn't get supper until like 8 30 9 o'clock at night and typically spanish people don't eat dinner until very late at night anyway mm -hmm. And it was terrible because you'd be going to bed in a full stomach and I'm just not yeah. used to doing that. You wouldn't get to bed to like, you wouldn't finish dinner until almost 10 o'clock. Oh, and wow. then you're ready to go to bed and you're like full as an egg, you know? <laughs> so it was, you know, it was really, really long days. And that was my only complaint. We saw, I mean, yes, we saw spectacular plants. We saw everything we wanted to see. But, it, you know, my question would be, could you have seen, could you just either extend the tour longer so the days were shorter, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's a happy medium. There's got to be a happy medium there somewhere. And I know that when I do my tours, I like to be back to the hotel by like 4, 35 o'clock. So sure. people have a chance then to get a shower, sit back, maybe have a, a before dinner drink <laughs> before you go out for dinner, you know, and then have your dinner finished by like 630. So then you can sort of sit back, ruminate out over the day, you know, think about what you saw for the day. Uh, relax a little bit and then go to bed and repeat it again the next day. Um, I didn't, you didn't have much time to ruminate <laughs> on this trip, right? It was just like, you know, by the time I finished dinner and then I was going through my pictures, trying to sort mm -hmm. through those, put names on them. And it's sort of 1030 at night. It's like, oh my God, I got to go to bed. Um, mo almost every day I was getting, you know, 10 to 20,000 steps a day, right? So we're just on our feet for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, there wasn't very much downtime at all. So I guess you wouldn't call it a holiday. <laughs> you know, it's, again, it's all it relative. Work. My, my idea a of a holiday of sitting yeah. on a on a cruise ship or on a beach no. is it just shoot me now, right? Yeah. It's the last thing in the world I want to do. <laughs> uh, so yes, it was it was a holiday for me. I this is the kind of stuff I love to do. 
but I'm sure for a lot of people that say, oh my God, this is just way too much work. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's wonderful work. We appreciate your sharing it with us. Thank you so much. No problem. Now, Anne, getting back to your thing for Barring Park in the spring, I've been trying to do a spring trip in Barring Park for years, and then it always ends up something coming up, something comes up, something comes up. Because my life is not my own in the month of June, uh, for the most part. <clears throat> but I will try, and it might be a spur of the moment. It might yep. be like you might you might only have four or five days notice. But if it comes into one of these weekends in June, of course, the best weekend to do it is probably going to be like the Father's Day weekend. And of course, people are off doing oh. other things on Father's Day weekend, right? I'm not. Um, <laughs> you're not. There you go. So maybe that's a way to spend your Father's Day. Uh, is to go on a, on a walk in Barring Park. But that's when a lot of things would be blooming in the park, you know, yeah. as far as the different hawthorns and the uh, crab apples and the lilacs mm-hmm. and all that. So that would be the ideal time. So I'll keep an eye on when things are blooming and keep an eye on my schedule. And yeah. if I can get a Sunday, um, even, one of those... a, even a morning, even a morning, the park may not be as crowded true if that's good for true. you yeah yeah i don't yeah. care no, I'll, I'll go out saturday after or supper. sunday morning but for me mm-hmm. actually the mornings probably would be a little bit e- even a bit easier but a lot of people i know i know like the sunday morning right? are busy. yeah yeah you know um but anyway i will like i said i'll drop Carm an email and then she can blast it out or whatever or karen can blast it out or you can blast it out uh mm-hmm. to the membership uh but like i said just keeping in mind you might only have four or five days notice that's perfect right so that might be enough for the real keeners that really wanted to, to do that i certainly don't mind doing it in the fall but i've always wanted to do it when things are in bloom as opposed to seeing things you know when they're putting on their fall foliage um, yeah. instead and so you said that every year them. yeah and like every year when we go you know and you go oh we should come here in the spring and i'm like yeah we gotta yeah. come here in the spring so. yeah i know i know yeah. right but like i said june is just such a hard month for me i know um, i know it's, you it's know, really just busy. one of those things. And then I got like said, two tours in early July. Um, so like I don't I don't even have a chance to touch earth until August most times. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's that's the sad part about Newfoundland summer. Like you're waiting for it all year and then you're busy. Like everybody's like that, right? Yeah. yeah. That's I know. It, right. It's, but now once I retire, <laughs> when I retire, <laughs> Oh, then you dear. can do a walk every week for us. Something and I different. can do a there walk whenever. <laughs> there you go. Okay. But anyway, yes, I will keep that in mind because I would like to do barring park trip in the spring of the year. I say yeah. spring. Technically, it's early summer perhaps <laughs> or very late spring, but mid-June. Mid uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So anyway, I will try to keep that in mind and try to squeeze that in if at all possible. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank you again, and thank you, everybody, for coming, and we'll see you in, if we don't see you during the summer, we'll see you in October, because we'll plan to have another Zoom meeting, and we welcome everybody then. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye.